Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here with all of you today. Welcome to uh, The Rule is to Stop, uh, Filipino, Filipino X Literary Symposium. Um, when Mark invited me to sort of bring Pal over here at the Asian Art Museum, I really, um, you know, coming from New York and coming home and coming back, it was uh, an amazing opportunity for me to get an education and learn about these people that I've always wanted to know more about and learn more about. And so um, I'm really tremendously happy and excited to um, gather everybody and really think about, um, you know, Al Robles and his peers, his friends, his community, uh, the Kearney Street Workshop poets, uh, Bay Area Filipino American writers, um, and also the prolific Barbara Jane Reyes. So um, this is why we're here today. Um, and before I formally introduce Taya and start the program, I do want to take a moment to pay tribute to um, Dr. Don Boholano Mabalon, who is has been an incredible um, figure in Filipino, Filipino American history, but for me also in American history at large. So really, um, if we think about transcribing Filipino American history in the larger history of American um, history, I think, you know, she did it um, in the most brilliant way. So take a moment to do that. Right. So I'm going to introduce Taya Kire Tagle, who is a writer, scholar, teacher, and curator interested in investigating the intersections between socially engaged art and site-specific performance, visual cultures of violence, urban redevelopment schemes, and grassroots responses to political crises across multiple scales. She recently curated two shows, Afterlife, What Remains in Queer Value, for the Alice Gallery in Seattle, Washington. I'm tremendously happy to welcome back Taya to the Bay Area to get us started today. Hi, good morning. Uh, I just wanted to say, or start by saying uh, thank you all for coming today to talk story and to celebrate the life and the work of Filipino American poets, Barbara Jane Reyes and the late Al Robles. I wanted to thank PJ, uh, Mark, and the Filipinx American Library at the Asian Art Museum for inviting me to open up uh, today's symposium with just a few words about Manong Al and Ate Barbara Jane, whose poetry and lives I researched intensively and wrote about between 2011 and 2015 um, as I was pursuing my PhD, uh, living here, struggling to live here with this high rent, and teaching over at SFAI and SF State. Um, I also wanted to dedicate today's keynote to Don Mabalan and her life's work of preserving the histories of Stockton's Filipino community. Uh, so to all of you, maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. So I first came to Al Robles' poetry and then to Barbara Jane Reyes's out of a need, a need to understand the history of first Manila Town and the international hotel struggle, and then San Francisco's current housing crisis, which was just beginning to hit fever pitch when I moved to the Bay in 2012. The historical archives were present but thin in the SF Public Library, SF State's Ethnic Studies Library, in the Fonz National Archive in Seattle, in the Kearney Street Workshop Papers at UC Santa Barbara, and even in the archives at Manila Town Heritage Foundation. There were traces of what really happened in Manila Town, but none fully captured the everyday lives of the Manongs and their children and the second generation of post-65 Filipino-American students who organized to save the International Hotel from destruction. 
It was, I came to understand, in the voices of Al Robles and Barbara Jane Reyes, and in the community's self-made cultural productions, that is to say, in the words of the Flip Poets, the images of Curtis Choi's documentary, The Fall of the Eye Hotel, and later in the thick descriptions found in activist historian Don Mabalon's Little Manila is in the Heart, and in Carlos Villa's My Uncle's series of installation works, that I could actually begin to smell the Bagong breath of the Manongs and envision their natty moves and outfits on the taxi dance hall floors from Stockton to South San Francisco. From the impressions that all of these artists and writers and activists and historians have left for all of us, I began to fill in the holes in history made by the demolition of the International Hotel. And I found that in the poetry of Barbara Jane Reyes and Al Robles, who are the focus of today's events, that poetry are special guides to remembering the I Hotel again or learning about it for the first time. As Al Robles said, poetry can help us all reshape our collective imaginations and visions for liberation to, quote, rearrange our own lives by rearranging the world in the community, creating a new world through poetry. Al Robles, as many of you in the room today know, was a de facto poet laureate of San Francisco's Manila Town. Born in 1930 in the Fillmore District, Robles' body of performed, improvised, and written poetic works gorgeously illuminated the lives of the Manongs, or that first generation, or first immigrant wave of Filipino laboring men who arrived in the U.S. with the status of U.S. national between the Philippine-American War through World War II. In the 1960s and 1970s, Robles spent time with these now elderly men at the Manila Town Senior Center, which he co-founded, collecting and preserving the smallest details of their lives, in verse like this one about Manong Jacinto Santo Tomas, who transformed his small bedroom into a makeshift fish processing plant. Oi, oi, come help me, hold that one. Hang and dry that fish in my room. First, I soak it in vinegar and salt. I cut from the head down, spread like bird wings. If you got plenty of that one, you lay them flat inside. Bathtub, the others you hang with that rope. And you have to imagine Al's voice, which is much more melodic than mine, right? So, Robles' poems like this one gave texture to the daily lives of the Filipino, Chinese, and other migratory laborers residing in the International Hotel and other such single occupancy residence hotels in the Manila Town District. Within their shoebox rooms, Manongs like Wahat Tampao, Claudio Domingo, and Felix Eisen would find refuge from their toils in the ag fields of Central California, the canneries and tanneries of Seattle and Alaska, and the private residencies and luxury hotels that housed San Francisco's elites. Where once, as young men, they would stay in the I Hotel for a night or a month on their way to other places of labor, in later years, the Manongs returned to the I Hotel as a permanent and final residence, a safe place and home worth investing in and saving. Growing up as one of the only Filipino-American children born in San Francisco in the early 20th century, Al was especially privy to the inner worlds of his bachelor uncles, who took him and his siblings in as his own, as their own. The opening lines of Guadalupe, come to me, my melancholy baby, powerfully conjured the entire world that the Manongs created in just a few square blocks around Kearney and Jackson. Tino's Barbershop, Manila Cafe, Adobo Rising from Carabao Plates, Lucky M Pool Hall, Pinstripe, Gabardine, English Tweed, Worsted, Macintosh Double-Breasted, Single-Breasted, Cara breasted Pinoy-Breasted Suits, 50, 60 years of dreams and nightmares rising out of mudfish eyes. In the public and private spaces of the bedroom, the pool hall, the barbershop, and the cafe, the Manongs live complicated lives of loss, heartbreak, and joy. Robles' poetry does not pathologize these Manongs or try to evoke pity for these men. Rather, he presents both the good and bad of their lives unflinchingly and portrays them as complex and morally ambiguous men that they truly were. As he said in The Wandering Manong, I am not ashamed of the Manong, nor do I feel sad by their tragic story in America. The Manongs have been on a long journey, and I have been one of those wanderers who they've met along the way. What right does anyone have to judge these Manongs who have come to America seeking for a new life? They have lived through so many wars and have the scars in their hearts to prove it. 
They lived, as it were, in two worlds, in a world they left behind, and in a dream before their eyes. From herding cows to herding cows, from fruit picker to fruit picker, from Alaska to Alaska, from Manila town to Manila town, inside a pocket, a handful of fish. So in my longer body of writing um, about Al Robles, I talk about his poetry as the Manila town blues, or a form of improvisational spatial poetics that works to make connections across real and imagined social and geographic distance. Robles' blues are not simply metaphors, but work to produce a blues geography of San Francisco, a place where Filipinos and other people of color were not surplus or discardable populations, but were seen as essential to its past, present, and future as a global city. His blues poems connect the land struggles in the Philippines with housing rights struggles in the International Hotel. It connected the plight of Filipinos being displaced from San Francisco with those of black, native, and Latino communities who were also being pushed from their rightful homes and lands by the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency, private developers, and new affluent arrivants, or gentrifiers. His poetry was and is a crucial support of, source of support for the decades-long on-the-ground movement to save the International Hotel, which developers and this city tried to turn into a parking lot for the expanding financial district without a care for the Manong's living, dancing, and loving within its walls. Al Robles's blues, as the historical I Hotel movement also did, and which anti-eviction movements today need to do more of, articulated a vision for a multiracial, multigenerational, cross-class movement for housing justice that was not separate from the fight for full racial equality for indigenous peoples and people of color. Thus, while Al Robles is imagined as only belonging to the Pinoys of Manila town, I actually believe he was a Filipino people's poet and the people of San Francisco's poet, daring to dream freedom for everyone. This is just a verse from uh, Rapping with 10,000 Carabaos in the Dark. Ah, Filipinos, if you only knew how brown you are, you'd slide down from the highest mountaintop, you'd whip out your lava tongue and burn up all that white shit that's keeping your people down. A child of the second wave, gener uh, a child of, the second wave of Filipino immigration to the U.S., Barbara Jane Reyes's work maps alternative genealogies and geographies of the Filipino Bay Area than that of Robles and the Flip Poets. Reyes's background and literary recognition are evidence of several sea changes between the first and second waves of Filipino migration. First, the 1965 Immigration and Naturalization Act reforms that brought professional class Filipinos to the U.S. under categories of family reunification and special skills. Then the removal of racially restricted housing covenants that allowed for the first time people of color to move to formerly all-white suburbs. And third, the success of the 1960s and 70s movements for ethnic studies to be institutionalized in higher education. Born in Manila, uh, but raised in the sprawling East Bay suburb of Fremont, Barbara Jane Reyes went on to receive a BA in ethnic studies from UC Berkeley and an MFA in creative writing from SF State. Since then, she's cultivated a prolific career as a poet and writer, winning awards including the James N. Laughlin Award from the American Academy of Poets for 2005's Poeta in San Francisco, the Global Filipino Literary Award for Poetry for 2010's Diwata, and the 2006 Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Fellowship. This kind of mainstream success distinguishes Barbara Jane from many other Filipino-American poets, including Al Robles. And yet it does not mean that she in any way is separate from the larger Bay Area Filipino communities from which she came. Reyes has a very large body of published poetry to draw from, so I was just going to talk briefly today about two uh, poem place markers from her 2003 debut, Gravity is of Center, and the 2005 collection, Poeta in San Francisco. In these poems, Barbara pays her utang or respects to Al Robles, the Plip poets, and the Manong generation, while she simultaneously traces histories and spaces of Filipino women in the Bay Area, stories of love, violence, and survival that receive barely a mention in many tellings of Filipino America. Addressing her cultural predecessors and place markers, Reyes begins by dedicating it to Al Robles and for the elders whose stories he told. And the poem later has a verse for Robles that reads, Fillmore Street, San Francisco, California, 
Jazz and life on the edges are daily improvisations where streets are cold. Family is the folks who sit at your table, sell you the morning paper, wander the neighborhood, and collect your stories for safekeeping. Poet elder, your conduit and vessel, your voice of protest. Who says history is only about dead white people? You have transcribed history. It's about us. And again, imagine my voice is more poetic. Okay. So aligning herself with Robles' creative and political praxis, Barbara Jane Reyes, too, strives to, quote, commit to memory the aftershave, the black fedora, the red silk tie pattern with black hearts, end quote, of the Manongs. She does this, though, while identifying herself as a Filipina of a different generation of suburban comfort in newly painted track homes. Her experience as a Filipino-American woman in the Bay Area and those of other Filipino women are further mapped in Poeta, a collection of poems that move in and between the Pacific theaters of war to the strip clubs of Kearney Street, illuminating scars left on Filipinas, and thinking here of the name for both the nation, Filipinas, and women as Filipino women, by imperialism, globalization, and patriarchy. An exceptional book, Poeta undoes the binary of Filipino women as good wives or incalcitrant harlots, showing that even Filipinas who've been able to settle into middle-class homes in Daly City and far-flung suburbs of East Bay are never fully able to distance themselves from the space-time of U.S. empire. These women, as these poems recount, are displaced from the Philippines, yet still feel the effects of Marcos's martial law. They hold trauma from sexual assault carried out in U.S. military bases in Han Hanhal City and Olongapo and they live through domestic violence dispensed by partners in California and Manila. There's a spate of poems in the book named after San Francisco neighborhoods, J-Town, C-Town, M-Town, and more cheekily after areas that mainstream discourse has produced as Calle de Section Ocho, Calle de Comidas Exoticas, and Calle de Consejo Practico. The landmarks of these places are not built structures, but instead are the tactile auditory and other bodily sensations felt by women therein. These places carry women's embodied memories, such as the salty wetness of Bagoong and Manila Town, and the fluttering eyelashes of, quote, roseate cheek beauties whose hair spun silk glow at midnight in Japantown. Visiting the same neighborhoods in San Francisco where Al Robles said iconic poems like 1970s Fillmore excuse me, 1976's Fillmore Black Ghetto. Reyes's place poems reiterate the street smart logic that women must carry if they're going to make it through the city unscathed. So Calle de Consejo Practico advises, do not be deceived by ethnic ghetto, says barbershop and boogie, use reasonable caution when walking on savory districts for kicky dining amongst lush and plus urbanoids, kooky and kitschy, freewheeling free trendoids for even the most moneyed sport funk to grunge artsy attire. Calle de los Morenos advises, you cannot run from their eyes, avoid dark streets, and always avoid speaking to dark men on sidewalks when they holla, hola, chula, chinita, japonesa. Calle de la Oscuridad says, do not give non-vets change or cigarettes, hold your purse close to your breast, class facing inward. Some do not have legs, so you can rest assured they will not follow you. If you walk quickly past them, hold your breath, but do not make it obvious. These feminized forms of geographic knowledge contained within Poeta in San Francisco are a poetic and practical survival guide for other new immigrant women to the city. They are a counterpart to Al Robles' poems, which uncover strategies that the Manongs and other men of color deploy to make it through in a racist, sexist U.S. Ultimately, while she recounts violence against women in explicit and implicit form, Reyes's Filipinas are not simply victims, but fighters and survivors. As she documents in later books, Diwata and Talavad as Aswang, we witness the women in Poeta in San Francisco materially and metaphorically transform their conditions to reconstruct their spirits, their bodies, and even the built environment itself. In our collisions, we learn to make new from our lacerated and fractured selves appendages resembling tails, horns, and shempre, wings to capture breath. One day she will build a temple from detritus, dust of your crumbling empire's edicts. Its walls will hold with blood and spittle, brackish water and sun-dried grasses. Within these walls she will inscribe her own terms of worship upon every pillar and column, glyphs resembling earth and ocean. With a fire you once took to her flesh, she will melt down your weapons, forge her own gods, and adorn her own body. 
while creating a new world without any prior trace of colonialism, patriarchy, racism, and sexism is not possible either in the Philippines or San Francisco. There's still power in dreaming decolonization and freedom through poetry and prose. Barbara Drain Reyes might call this, quote, following instructions for viewing subjective catastrophe, while Al Robles might consider this the work of rearranging the world through poetry. Either way, the rule is, do not stop. Thank you. And now I think we're moving on to the first panel. So if you could please come up, Tony Robles. Jason Bayani and Shirley Anchetta. Thank you. This is really high tech. Oh, it's already on. <laughs> uh, anyway, how's everybody doing? Well, thanks for coming out, um, leaving your warm beds, and I hope you're not having too many respiratory problems because of the fires that are uh, all around us. So we were going to flip a coin. And when I say flip, I don't mean that in a, <laughs> any pun intended. Um, I was thinking, you know, maybe, um, you know, maybe Shirley, maybe, maybe you want to start, because, I mean, you were really, really tight with my uncle, and, you know, he, he really loved you, and you spent a lot of time together, you know, so. Well, why don't we just kind of dialogue, the yeah. two of us, and then okay. see if we can take up half an hour between the two of us, Sounds or good. 20 minutes, or, good. or five minutes. I don't know if I have a lot to say. <laughs> so it's great to be here. Um, it's, a, it's a real honor to be um, talking about Al and, and the movement days and being among all of you and, and having Barbara Jane's poetry honored. It's a, uh, so thank you. Thank you, PJ and Mark and the staff. And um, thanks for all the good words and your hard work. Um, where, do, where do we start? Um, I know you, you guys discussed Luwanag at the Kearney Street workshop. Oh, Luwanag, right. Luwanag. I can't pronounce it. Luwanag. Okay. So, um, when I came to, to San Francisco, I, I believe that had already been published. Um, I come from Watsonville. Uh, I was raised there. I, actually, that's the same city that um, Russell Leong's dad was born in and grew up in. So, we've got, we've got uh, Russell in the house. It's great to see you. Um, he so graciously gave me this bun because he figured, God, you haven't eaten and it doesn't look like I've eaten in a while. So, But another thing about Russell is he was the editor of Rapping with 10,000 Carabaos in the Dark, uh, which was the uh, collection of uh, poetry by uh, my uncle Al Robles. So, <laughs> so when I... I showed up on the scene. It was probably around 1976, 1977. Um, I grew up in Watsonville. Um, I had met Jeff Tagami in fourth grade. <laughs> we were already a couple then. Um, uh, we came to um, third world literature and writing through our friend Alan Blau, who, who was 
from SF State and who had just come back from Japan and was living in San Francisco. Um, no, Santa Cruz, after that. So he introduced us to Ish Reed's work, Yardbird Reader, a lot of the third world stuff. Um, Counterpoint, was there something called Counterpoint way back then? And I remember Jeff and I were, we were already reading like Philip Levine and Tess Gallagher and we, we had met Jessica Hagedorn and, and Lost in Inada. But when we first came upon all of this work, Caillou Shoes, um, Asian American literature, we thought, oh shit, we got to write poetry, but now we got to actually identify as Filipino or Asian American and what do we do with this, right? We just kind of wanted to write poetry. Um, we hadn't reached that consciousness yet. Um, we were aware, we were taking uh, Chicano history classes, black history classes, Native American classes, because those, um, those studies were just being um, formed at the universities. They were still being developed, the curriculum. So uh, we would take those classes to understand the literature that we were reading that was coming through, the new black voices, um, under the belly of a shark or a whale or whatever the, those books were. So when we first came to San Francisco, uh, we were already familiar with Kearney Street Workshop. We had gone to a lot of their readings. We knew Russell by then and Al. Um, we didn't yet, we weren't yet a part of the Kearney Street Workshop. So, um, but we were going to San Francisco State and we were part of the ASU Asian Student Union. And Jeff and I would leaflet every goddamn cold winter morning at I Hotel. We were with the ASU and the Chinese Progressive Association. Where were the Filipinos? They were PACE, right? So um, they were planning their potlucks and basketball. <laughs> They weren't really progressive at that point, and you know, Jeff was wearing his Mao Zedong hat, and you know, we were just leaflet every morning. That's how it went until one day, Lucia came over and said, "Hey, why don't you check out our place here in the basement?" And we started to follow Lou and our friend Sharon Lou our roommate, who was part of the ASU, says, no, you got a leaflet for two more hours, and then you can go look at the murals and do all that kind of stuff. Um, so when we ended up joining up, uh, Kearney Street Workshop welcomed us with open arms. They, they were, it was an Asian American workshop, which was Japanese, there was jam, there were, um, Japanese, Lei Nishikawa, I remember he didn't even need one of these things because he would yell into the, <laughs> he'd yell, he'd wish he'd do that, right? There was Lei Nishikawa, uh, Doug Yamamoto, um, Presco Tabios, Bayani Mariano, uh, Norman Jayo, Lou, Al, Al, he was a big, he was a leader. Nelson Yi, the, he was the leech who was always trying to kiss the women at the parties and stuff like that. I mean, <laughs> Kearney Street wasn't without its problems with um, gender inequality, right? We had those problems. I can remember when Jessica Hagedorn, I wasn't there, but I heard about it. Jessica Hagedorn, Geraldine Kudaka, Lorraine Marr, they all stomped out of there forever. Right? The next week they showed up at my apartment and said, we, we're starting our own group. So, um, <laughs> we, we traveled, we, we had our different groups. Um, I mean, when you're, when you're an Asian American writer, when you're an Asian American writer, what do you write about, right, when you're 20 years old? What do you think about writing about? What kind of thinking experience about writing, did you have? You're thinking about whether or not you can write at all. <laughs> and, you know, you're, 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 trying to, you know you're, you're trying to find your voice, but there's that cacophony of voices that tell you that you don't have a voice. So, 
you know, not only are you trying to find your voice, you're trying to find your way in academia, you're trying to pass your classes, you're trying to get a part-time job, and you're trying to overcome whatever insecurities uh, are coming from within and, and, and other insecurities that might be imposed upon you by all of these things that you're coming across, you know. I mean, I remember, I remember going to SF State and, and Jason Bayani reading a poem called, you know, this is the last angry poem. And I'm thinking, I don't know, man. There's probably some more angry poems that are going to come, <laughs> come down the pipe. Remember, remember that one? You remember that it's one, a, right? This was the, such a long that. time ago. <laughs> but you're right. There were more. <laughs> well, you were angry about, I mean, you know, like I was saying, you know, you're trying to find your own voice. You're trying, you know, in, in, in finding your own voice, you're trying to figure out where you, you know, where you fit in in the society, what you're what your role as a person is in your community, in your family, uh, you know, as, as a person, what, what holds meaning in your life and what gives your life meaning, right? And, well, I think, well, like, like with Jason, right, I think hip-hop played a lot in terms of the, the struggles that you were having regarding right and wrong and all the politics that were happening in your neighborhood, right? It gave the, it helped to give uh, uh, a kind of context to look at things um, or an understanding, uh, a lens to look through, to look at America um, that, that I didn't feel I had. Um, it introduced me to a way to talk about it, a way to see it that lived outside of kind of like, you know, the white supremacist culture that I was already living in. Um, and I think that's why, why I grabbed was able to gravitate there at Zip Hop because, you know, I had no way to name these things. I only knew that I didn't belong in this world and this is the only thing that's telling me that there's something different from it and there's something that's examining it and there's something that's working against it. And, yeah. And back in my day, we were still finding all those stereotypes. Um, we weren't appearing in a lot of your regular dominant culture anthologies. So um, people of color were, were publishing their own. Um, let's see, in San Francisco, I think it was Time to Greece was one of them with uh, Alejandro Mejia and uh, Geraldine Kadaka, I think they were, they might have been the editors. So the, those were the really early times when we were just trying to find a voice. So there, was, there were a lot of identity poems. Um, I guess you could write about your family, you could write about your sex life. I mean, that's what you do when you're in your 20s and you, you know, you think, God, what kind of experiences have I had? Have I traveled? And yeah, I traveled to, you know, that person's bed and I, I'm going to write about it, right? So, it, you know, it was, <laughs> so you would, we wrote about our ancestors, uh, we imagined our ancestors, and I think that's where Al pulled up this whole idea about the Carabao and Ifuga Mountain. Um, it was a place that was somewhere out there, somewhere we had never been to, somewhere that our parents came from and they had never been back. A lot of our generation, our parents came, or our grand grandparents or grandparents, came through Hawaii through the uh, sugar plantations um, to get here and then finally to the mainland. So we were making up the stuff, right? I, I can remember somebody saying later on about Al's stuff, you know, it's not true about all that stuff that he writes about in, you know, Efugao Mountain. That's, that's not true and it didn't matter. That was Al's world. That was our world. Um, want to talk a little bit about yeah, that? Uh, yeah, I, I heard that too. Somebody said, well, that mountain, um, you know, doesn't, doesn't exist. But you can always say the same thing about the Golden Gate Bridge. I mean, for some of us, the Golden Gate Bridge does not exist, right? When the bridges between people have been, right? You know, so how golden... <laughs> really is that bridge. And for a lot of us, you know, the American dream doesn't exist, right? So you can, you can look at that at a lot of different levels. I think, you know, in terms of a writer and the writing life, one of the misconceptions that people make is that they separate, they think that writers have, 
you know, access to all these different experiences and resources and, 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 and whatnot. Um, and what, what people refer to when they think of writing is really what they're talking about is reading. And they're, th they're, they're thinking, well, you know, you must have read Moby Dick, or you must have read, uh, you know, Harry Pothead, or, you know, or whatever, right? They're not thinking about the writing life of that writer when, you know, what really inspired somebody to write like an Al Robles was the neighborhood that he came from, is, you know, the smell of Biko that was, you know, cooking in the, uh, in, 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 in the oven, or the sound of his mother's voice who, you know, spoke a language that, you know, he didn't grow up, uh, you know, knowing and wish that he had been taught, but at that time, you know, that wasn't something that was, uh, that was encouraged, right? So, but the thing to kind of take away from Uncle Al, and, and the thing that I think was really articulated very well in the Curtis Choi movie uh, on him, the, um, you know, Time Travel with Al Robles documentary short film, was that, you know, you have his writing life and you have his life as an activist and you have his life as a musician and you have all of these different lives taken together and they're all inextricable. I mean, his writing life from his life as an activist or a housing advocate and a poet. I mean, one of the things he always says was, I'm just a poet. He didn't, he went, like, without names, right? You know, he didn't get so far into or hung up on uh, the biography or the... Uh, or, or, or the resume or, you know, because to him a resume was almost like, what, what do you call the thing, you know, on a gravestone? It was like a resume could be an epitaph <laughs> in a way, you know, for him, right? So, you know, for him it was spontaneous. And not, not to ramble on too long, but there were some metaphors um, about him. He played football in high school. He was a, a defensive end. Uh, he played the same, actually, position that Ronnie Lott played with the Niners. So you got to be bad. I mean, to play that position, you have to like contact. Uh, and you have to be able to uh, make contact and make contact with impact. So as a housing advocate, as a poet, he made that impact, right? He made impact with people, impact that lingered. So when he hit you, boom, you felt it, right? And it could be in a poetic way. It could be in a way that was trying to help people get to where they needed to go, you know, uh, lending his, his help and his time, you know, I mean, I can't think of, you know, there were so many times where he helped people get jobs or, uh, you know, put people in the right direction to get to where, that they, were, where they were trying to go. Um, he was a jazz musician, right? And in, in that way, you know, a, a pianist, he was a jazz pianist, um, learning uh, through that the rhythm of words, the rhythm of of uh, the rhythm of poetry, right? And when you, you were talking about uh, identity, you know, the Filipino Ako poem, Ako Ay Filipino, that was really an anthem and kind of a call to our consciousness of having been a colonized country and having been colonized in so many ways where all of these feelings about what we were as people were built up in our throats and all of the phlegm and it was stuck and he articulated basically what people were feeling in our community about ourselves, but didn't know how quite to, uh, to articulate it. So, you know, he was able through that, that poem to, to kind of assert that and say, hey, you know, this is, this is who we are, this is, this is us, and just lay it out there like a, like a plate of fish and rice and, 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 and let people partake of it and smell it and taste it. And I don't know if you want to talk on that too, but that's, so it was multifaceted, there was a lot of, you can't really define my uncle or his poetry in, in, in one way, it was just a lot of different dimensions to him. I mean, people thought he had gone to Japan because he, he was so zen and everything, and um, most people still do, but I think it was actually because he, he had built tea houses at his place on Fillmore and those other places, right? And so he housed different Japanese folks, uh, monks, artists, uh, just people who he would bring in. Um, so he was, gosh, it's, it's hard to encapsulate the man. He was everybody. He, did, he was a trickster, too, right? You know how... Um, he looks like everybody, but nobody looks like him. 
you know, he's one of those kind of guys. He was the guy who resisted getting his poetry collection together. He was one of the last of the Kearney Street Workshop people to get his poems um, in a book. So it was actually Russell who, who conjured that one up. And um, it came through Amerasia, right? You, you see a leg? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Russell. That was great. Um, yeah. So, how did Baypa? How did the, the the how did those writers start out? That was probably around 1979. Um, <clears throat> Jaime Jacinto had just come back from Mexico City um, with his wife and new baby, and we were sitting at, in our kitchen one day and. Jeff and Jaime were going back and forth and they said, well, let's see if we can get the group together because it was post I Hotel and we had lost a place. I mean, I think the, the Kearney Street Riders were still getting together, but it was at random moments. It was whenever somebody had a chance and it wasn't always at the same place. Um, I believe Jim Dong was still, was executive director at the time. So, um, we thought, okay, let's do it. Let's have a potluck. <laughs> let's have some food and some wine and uh, uh, let's do what we used to do and let's just see who shows up. We told folks about it. Guess what? Everybody showed up. It, it was a really fun time. And Presco was one of the first to show up. Virginia Serrano showed up. Again, there weren't that many women Filipina, let's see, me, Virginia, Jessica had already moved to New York City. Please help me if I'm forgetting anybody, you know, I'll go through the names in a minute. But, so, huh? Jenny? Jenny Lim. Lim, yeah, she was part of the, the Kearney Street workshop, but when Baypa got together, it, deci it was decided that we were all going to be the flips, right? So Nancy Hom and Jenny, um, they were part of the Kearney Street workshop. So here we got, no? And Katie Carriaga? Katie who? I'm trying to remember. That was Kitty. Oh, Kitty. That was earlier on, and I think that was part of Kearney Street workshop. Yeah, so Baypa was in 79 and it became a Filipino-American thing. Mm. So um, I, I don't know how it ended up being that way. It was, we were ripe for it. Um, during that time, I think Norman Jaya was working on his uh, Quiet Thunder script that uh, something, it was a, a film that was based on um, Carlos Bolosan. 
And even though that film was never completed, he went on to write a successful radio play called Quiet Thunder that starred a lot of the people who were part of the workshop, part of AATW, uh, Frank Chin's workshop, and a few other local people for all the Filipino voices and everything. So that was successful. I think Mela Squeta had a play during that time also. Uh, uh, Mela Squeta. Oscar had follower of the, followers of the season about the Alaskan canneries. Mm -hmm. Because way back then, our uncles, our brothers, our dads would go up to Alaska and either do crab or do salmon. So there was a lot of work done about labor. That's what it was about. Um, just like the Chicanos had La Lucha about their struggle, we talked about our struggle in the fields, the Delano strikes, Larry Itliong, Philip Veracruz. Um, that's what we wrote about. And we wrote about our moms and our dads. And, and during that time, we started, a lot of people started publishing, either through uh, Joseph Buchek's Greenfield Review, uh, Breaking Silence, um, Open Boat was until, until 1993. Jeff and Jaime did um, a Spanish-speaking translation of the Asians in South America and in, in Spanish-speaking nations. So there were, um, we, people were publishing. Um, in 1979, also, I remember attending an MLA convention that was here in San Francisco, and it, was, it took the one I went to took place at the uh, St. Francis, and there was a discussion about Maxine Hong Kingston's book. That was a big deal back then, right? She was really successful. The men were seething. I mean, because they so they were. Frank Shin, they called her inauthentic, right? The Carp Boys. You know, they had a point that sometimes, the, I think they were reacting to the successful readership and the amount of coverage she was getting. Um, so, at this, con at this discussion group, they were really down on Maxine for not being authentic, for making her work be dependent upon stereotypes and that's why it was so popular and that's why there was a big white readership and that's why she did so well. At the same time, Year of the Dragon was going on too, so it, it, wasn't, it wasn't like there, were, there was only one voice coming, there were a multitude of voices, so that, that's what we realized about our group too, even though we have that common thread about being Filipino Americans, we came from different places. Jeff was like fourth generation. His great grandfather had been a Cataponero. His his uh, his mother's father was purportedly the labor commissioner from the Philippines, Francisco Verona. So she was an illegitimate product of, of this guy who had come to Hawaii and, uh, and the mainland to check out the Filipinos, uh, the Filipino laborers and see how they were working out. So th there were, we had, we had uh, mestizos and hapas and all sorts of, we had all sorts of Filipinos. I came from a small town and there were the, these really slick, sophisticated Filipinos who knew how to dance. I mean, where I came from, we were hippies and we didn't know how to dance. The Filipino guys went with white women. They wouldn't look at me. I mean, it was like I was their sister. Jeff and I were kind of a freaky couple because we were both Filipino and we liked each other, right? But <laughs> we broke that mold in our town. So it was... Vapa was a combination of many different voices, many different people, and we honored all of those voices. How much time do we have? <laughs> okay. Oh, get, to ten, get to nine minutes till I go. Oh, nine minutes till I go? Till you go? Okay. <laughs> and I'll take off. Right. Um, 
you know, with knowing our history and knowing our knowing our past and knowing what we wanted to accomplish as riot as writers to connect with the community to have the voice of the community um, was really important it, we we f somehow fulfilled those desires um, we didn't just write for us we didn't i don't think we wrote to become famous or anything like that i, I think it was we things just kind of fell into place sometimes, right? Some people went on to, uh, to do more things with their writing. Uh, Jessica was already a big name. Um, uh, Al did his stuff in San Francisco, but he traveled around and he brought his word everywhere. Uh, Jeff was picked up by a PBS and NPR, and his voice could be heard through there, because his represented the voice of the farm worker in Watsonville, and not just the Filipino farm worker, it was also the Chicano and the guy from the Azores, that kind of thing. But he, um, he was able to document the all of those labor camps that existed along Coast Road between here and Santa Cruz, and on through Watsonville, and to remember Furman Tabera, who was killed in Watsonville, the first Filipino to be murdered um, in America. So we, we came from, from different places, different voices. Um, you know, that whole thing about don't, don't stop, please don't stop, please don't stop. It, it's great that, uh, that we've got Jane now doing her voice. It's the, it's the new voice. We've kind of, it's no longer we have to do identity poems or anything like that. We can just kind of fly with what we need to say. And we're free to do that. We still have loyalty to our communities, but we're a bit more freer to do things, and nobody's going to say, you're not authentic, you're, that's not right, okay? But I know there's still problems with gender equality. It still exists. My brothers are still kind of the same way. I still got to sometimes bring their coffee to the table if it's a, a gathering of sorts, right? Um, now, one of my mentors in Santa Cruz was... Uh, was a couple, James Houston and Jeannie Houston. I still hang around with Jeannie Houston. Jim Houston is gone now, but you know, he was, he was a really great writer and teacher, and he was also a travel writer. But he had something where he said, um, when he was talking about the travel writer, when you write about the journey you've been on, know where you've been, and know your facts. It was something like that. I'm, I'm probably paraphrasing it. But I, I take that to heart as far as the way we should carry our ancestors, our hearts, and our connections always, and, and, and be true to that. You want to say anything? I think you said it off. Yeah. Jason. Uh, no, I was thinking make because uh, there's a lot of things that were brought up. Maybe if, if uh, I move into my section now, we can increase the time yeah. for to revisit some of the things that were brought up. Yeah. Cool, cool. All right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, my name is Jason Bayani. I'm the artistic director for Kearney Street Workshop. Um, I started working there about four years and four months ago, uh, according to my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> um, uh, I... When I first came to KSW, so, you know, I'm, here's where kind of the connection or, you know, where I begin to intersect um, with, with these folks here is um, I came to San Francisco State around, uh, I think, yeah, 1994. Jeez, yeah, I know. It's, uh, <laughs> you can hardly believe I can be that. But, uh, it's the youthful face. Um, what you call it? And and I wasn't a writer then. Um, I actually came, you know, I I I actually took the major because I had no major, 
And my English teacher kind of was like, you should take this major. And, um, you know, when I started writing, I didn't see any other, you know, I wasn't exposed to any other, like, Filipino artist, Asian American artist, until I met Jaime Asinto, who was um, one of my instructors for one of my classes. And uh, through Jaime, I, you know, Jaime brought like Shirley and Jeff to class, introduced me to like, you know, all the other country workshop poets through their books. Um, and also the folks like Lawson and Nato, he's still one of my favorite poets. Um, and that is to me like KSW was always this kind of, was, was always the books. And, and for the longest time, as a writer, I was like, I, I want my first book to be published uh, by KSW. Um, and that didn't end up happening, but you know, in some way I, I knew that I, that I would come to KSW. I just didn't know it would be as their artistic director um, at some point. So um, yeah, the, so that's how I was kind of uh, introduced to, to this organization through books. And uh, later on, I got to do a couple events with them, including Aperture, um, which is our yearly festival for emerging uh, Asian Pacific American artists. It's a multidisciplinary festival. We have like six showcases. It's coming up this October. Uh, you should check it out. I forgot my flyers. <laughs> but yeah, it's happening. <clears throat> um, October 13th. But. Um, the thing with the KSW is that, you know, the last book we published was in the late 90s, maybe 1999, and that was with Trung, uh, Trung Tran. And uh, Trung Tran, who was one of our former EDs, uh, a great poet, uh, also a great visual artist, and um, that was the last book that was published uh, by KSW. Um, our engagement with literary artists comes mostly through Aperture, the occasional reading, and um, you know we're 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 a pan-Asian organization. So um, through Aperture, we featured you know some of our, some of our featured artists have gone on to do a lot of great things in literary arts, including Barbara Jane Reyes, who was a featured artist back in two thousand two or three, one of the, oh three, one of those yeah oh three. We've also had like Shalja Patel. Uh, great Southeast Asian, South Asian poet, um, Amy Suzara, Ishil Yi Park, uh, Russell Gonzaga, who's like, you know, was, was doing, when I first started Slam, was like the big Slam champion. Um, and also, like, uh, more recently, folks like Ti Bui, who's uh, winning, like, all the awards now for her, for her graphic novel, and, also, and uh, folks like, um, uh, oh, shoot, why am I blanking out right now? Uh, Vanessa Hua uh, was a, our last feature. And it's just like a lot of amazing writers have come through. And, and now we've established a bi-monthly uh, reading series called KSW Presents. Um, and you know, where we can bring in folks from across the country and locally to come engage with our audiences and also provide opportunities for, you know, for established readers to read, sometimes read with emerging um, writers, and uh, you know our last our last event was was great. We had um, Chen Chen, Muriel Lung, um, Eugene Chen, and Kristen Chang, uh, and the theme were were uh, the theme revolved around queer writers from the Taiwanese and Chinese diaspora. Uh, coming up in September on September twenty eighth, we're bringing in Elaine Castillo and Ingrid Rojas Contreras. Uh, to talk about their new uh, books. And so I think a lot of what we're trying to do now when it comes to, um, when it comes to, to our, our literary programs is to kind of look at um, writers working around theme. Uh, we want to engage more with other POC communities and have them engage with uh, Asian American writers uh, we did that also last year when we did a reading between Kundiman and Cantamundo, uh, where we had uh, Melissa, uh, <clears throat> Melissa Sippen, uh, Jay Lee Alde, um, and, and who am I blanking out on? 
uh, they were reading with Javier Zamora, uh, Oscar Bameo, uh, Leticia Hernandez, and it was, it was dope. And then these are things that we want to keep doing because we also have an educational program, um, an educational program, IWL, which we do with uh, the Asian Art Museum, which is a three-month program for writers of color where they get to go through three different um, genres of writing together with three different instructors. Uh, this year it was Amy Suzara, Dixon Lamb, and Javier Zamora. And, um, you know, it's, uh, we're having a reading next Thursday, too. You can come back for that. Yeah. <clears throat> but, yeah, th this is kind of like, you know, I can't simply know, it's not the way that, that, that um, we're having to engage with literary now is, is I think, it's it's not as much, as, it's not the same ways that it was before. I think there are so many different places that people are, um, are able to kind of, um, you know, take workshops, get together, a lot of different organizations people go through. I mean, like, people can come through IWL, but they're also, like, going through Vona. They're also going through Kundiman. And, um, you know, it, it's not like there's different options for people now. And then you also have their MFA programs, different reading series, uh, or different like scenes. Like, you know, some folks go through literary scenes, some folks go through the poetry stamp scene or both. And, and there's just multiple organizations now for folks to go through. But now, so now it's like, you know, we're still creating a space where they can come to that is different um, from a lot of other spaces they can get. Um, one that's revolved around, uh, one that, that puts a lot of focus on emerging Asian Pacific American writers. Um, and also, you know, we're constantly having to look at and consider, you know, our philosophy towards, uh, towards what, you know, what is the merit of, of literature and, and um, how does this tie into KSW's uh, grassroots and activist history and I remember we were just a week ago, I, I took um, Kazumi Chin, who's a great poet uh, and someone we've been working with and curates our KSW Presents series because he wanted to look at our archives. And one of the things, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm just basically paraphrasing this because he stated this like a lot more beautifully than I can, I can share with you right now. But he was looking through all the archives and especially through all the books. I mean, we have so many books and all these different different like uh, anthologies that were compiled throughout the years and, and he was talking about like how we look at history and you'll know, often, I mean pretty much the history that we're given is, is, is recorded moments and more often than not it is recorded moments of, of, of humanity's brutality. And that's what we're given as history. And he, he wanted to reimagine history um, through, not through these markers, but through movements and responses, you know, to cultural shifts and changes in vision. And, and, and he looked at all the books and he's just like, all this work, all this response to what is happening at the time is, is, is just as important as all these names that we prop up in poetry. Um, and how do we, how do we bring, you know, how do we, how do we engage in poetry this way? How do we engage in our literature this way? Um, as these kind of like recordings of what is happening in the moment um, through the people who are experiencing it. Um, and through the people who, who, who are living it at the time. Um, how do we make that important as well? And that's kind of, um, you know, I think that's something we're, we're, we're thinking about, you know, we're looking at. And, and um, how this all comes together, I don't know. I mean, we're still kind of, and when we look towards the future and you think about like, you know, we have books, but there's also media the, you know, online media and, and, and think about things like podcasts and, 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 um, being, and being able to engage that way. And so, yeah, that's kind of a little bit of what's happening right now at, uh, in KSW and what's happened in the last couple of years. Yep.
Petit mètre. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I might add, um, well, Je um, Al passed away 2009, and Jeff passed away in 2012. But the one-year anniversary of Jeff's death, June 2013, um, some of the writers from Kearney Street Workshop got together, and some friends and family got together. And I, there were some ashes that we were able to get from Russell Robles, and I had some ashes too of Jeff's. Not I didn't part with all of it, <laughs> some of it. And we went up to the New Eye Hotel. We went up to the roof, and we had a we had a memorial. We did we blew some poetry. We did some singing, and then we tossed some of that those ashes off the roof. And as I remember, some of the ashes came back and hit us in the face. <laughs> that was a trip, but you know, I mean, how befitting to have at the top of the I Hotel the, you know, scattering of the ashes and having a ceremony because, you know, the beautiful thing about the poetic work or the poetry of both my uncle and, and Jeff Tagami is they both had that kind of, kind of sensibility that was kind of an older sensibility. I think it was, you could even call it a depression era, uh, a depression era type sensibility. I mean, I could easily see Jeff's work among, you know, if you had said that his work was published in like 1935, 1936, you could, you could totally see it. There was a humility and there was a grace in Jeff's work and in the work of my uncle that really embraced uh, what uh, what our community felt it, they really had had their finger on the pulse of what the feelings were in the community and what you know I mean my uncle always talked about the journals right the journals of poets and poets coming to Manila town and going to the Manila towns throughout this country and how it was only the poets that could could really tell those stories of our community. It was only the poets that could do that. And I mean, even James Baldwin said the same thing, that it was the poets ultimately that tell you what it is to be human, what it is like to see somebody die, what is it like to be in love, what is it like to uh, feel pain, and that uh, a society that ceases to believe in the, re in the report that only a poet can make is a, is a society that's uh, on the verge of, 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 of dying a very, uh, dying a death of, of the soul um, and, 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 and spirit. Um, ultimately, I think too, you know, with our poetic voice, the way, you know, Jason was, was, was talking about coming to it and, and articulating it, is a way of our communities as poets, as artists, as vessels of the message of our storytelling and story giving is ultimately standing up for ourselves. You know, I mean, my uncle said that we are poets first and foremost, but, but we're not merely poets. You know, we have to be concerned and we have to stand up for the rights of our people. And we know that our people's rights are being stepped on, you know, day in and day out. So as poets, it's incumbent upon us to stand up for our community, to stand up for, for the poor, stand up for people that are marginalized, disenfranchised. Um, and as poets, we have, that, we have that power, not only to tell a story, but to bring people together and to bring those people in our story and give them agency to let them know that they're a part of, uh, to let them know that they are a part of, um, of that story. I think what we're really kind of Boiling it down to is when we're, we're, we're writing this, right? My uncle talked about writing away from yourself, right? Writing away, you know, writing um, away from your own community and embracing other communities outside of your, your own. Um, you know, I think we're writing towards, you know, for lack of a better word, we're, we're, we're writing towards grace really, which is community, which is embracing 
communities. And when I think of grace, I think of, you know, I do think of Jeff Tagami, and, you know, in a huge, huge way. When I think of writing with grace and a graceful message and articulating it in a beautiful, beautiful way, I think of Jeff just as I think of Toshio Mori and I think of Bienvenido Santos, you know, those Depression era writers who went through a lot and were able in a humble and beautiful way to articulate, uh, articulate that pain yet giving the reader enough space to enter that pain and feel it for themselves, right? Rather than being told, they allowed you to come in and feel it for yourself. And, and just quickly, as far as my own writing, you know, I, I came at this a different way coming into it. I never really had patience to read books. I wasn't a reader. I mean, the only thing I really read on any regularity was Guinness Book of World Records, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, and the sports page. I was always looking at the NFL standings to see if the Raiders were on top uh, and where, what the Niners, of course, were, were, were doing. What, uh, and, and everybody comes at it in a different way. Uh, what I was reading were people and behavior. And I was reading the things that were going on in front of my nose, the battles that were going on uh, over right and wrong, regardless of what degree. It could be at the job, it could be at, the, it could be at school, but all of these things that were happening, I was looking at it and trying to make sense of it, okay? So for me, it wasn't just, you know, going to the desk and writing this stuff down. I had to make a decision. I had to look at the stuff and figure out, okay, what does this mean, mean to me? And then if you take it another level, actually walking into that situation yourself and making a stand between what you know is right, what you know is wrong, and where are you going to fall, where, where are you going to come, come out in these different situations so that when you go to your journal, as Uncle Al talked about, um, you can write something that's truly true and truly connect with uh, the people that are meant to read whatever it is, whatever it is that you're writing. But I think one thing I wanted to bring up um, was that also too is like one thing that, you know one thing that that, that um, becomes necessary to think about is that you know in country workshops early days you know along when that hotel was torn down you know Tennessee workshop had to become somewhat nomadic and in that way that um, you're forced to learn that because you know your space is temporal that you have to go into spaces and transform them and I think that that's what a lot of you know throughout the years we've done as artists uh, and and to go into a space and kind of create something different to transform it so that you make a space that people take with them um, because the thing is that, like, you're constantly going from place to place that, that, that um, you know, uh, what you call that, that, um, I'm sorry, I'm like an out here, um, you know, that, that isn't, you know, isn't owned by you. And um, I think that's something that I, that's kind of like, you know, we have to try, you know, we try to take into account now. Um, you know, and I think it's something that I, you know, early on, I think coming into this community, you start to learn. Um, uh, it, it's something that, you know, when, when we look at the, um, uh, you know, the eyes, what can I do to, you know, the, the, that I'm trying, constantly trying to, uh, to bring into when I think about what we need to do at KSW in terms of programming, what we need to do in the, at KSW um, in terms of, of creating space, and, and <clears throat> you know, what can we do to continue to create the space of spaces where we begin to feel empowered, you know, to lay claim to our own narratives, and, and to no longer accept the ones created for us, and um, what can we do to create the space where we begin to trust our own voices. And, um, <clears throat> and I think back in 2001, I think, you know, I wanted to just share this one thing that I forgot to bring up. But back in 2001, um, you know, a bunch of a bunch of like poets came went to Seattle. I think it was like maybe like 
almost like a hundred of us and had a summit. And I remember like during the last night after reading, everyone spilled out onto the street and it was like this powerful thing. Everyone's like, you can actually see it online. They have a, they have a thing on YouTube, but everyone spilled out in the streets, just like tears come out their eyes. And like, you know, because it's the first time, you know, for a lot of us that, that we're able to see our art reflected in other people and, and to be able to hear our stories reflected back to us. Um, and I think about that space and I think about how can, how can we try, to, how can I try to cre create spaces like this over and over again? How do I adapt it? And that's something I keep coming back to um, as an organizer um, at KSW. And it's something that really kind of drives me. And then I think as an individual writer, I, you have to provide yourself that space in which to write. You may have a full-time job, you may be a mother, you may be someone's partner or daughter, you're, you're taking care of your elderly parents. But you need to make that space for yourself because what a writer does when they're trying to create those poems that will be uh, brought out to the community, you're also going to the source. You're going to that source, which is the world, which is space, which is God, which is whoever you want that light to be. And you are communicating, and we're all communicating together, and that's, that's what we need to provide for ourselves. And, and especially women. Man, I, I can't say it enough. Don't, uh, give yourself lots of space, because it's, there, there's, there's little, there's very little at times. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you so much, Tony, Shirley, and Jason. I encourage you all to follow and support Kearney Street Workshop. Uh, their books are uh, downstairs if you want to read and browse. And I'm excited to hear that Al's book is going to be republished next year. Uh, we are going to take a break, and we'll come back at 2 p.m. here for the second part of the day. So enjoy your lunch.